Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Professor Chris Early. I'm the Dean of the UTS Business School, and it's my wonderful pleasure today to host our webinar with our special guest, Mr. George Savides. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the UR Nation, upon whose ancestral lands the UTS City Campus now stands. I would also like to pay respect to the elders, both past and present, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for this land. Today's webinar is brought to you as part of a webinar series, UTS Illuminated, uh, celebrating the achievements of successful alumni who have been recognized as the 2020 UTS Alumni Award recipients. I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome our recipients, their guests, and the UTS alumni with us today, whether you are in Sydney or around the globe. Now, before we begin, some general house rules. This webinar is being recorded and, you'll be, and will be made available as a download via the UTS Alumni YouTube channel. We will share the link uh, details soon by email in the coming days. The format for today is a 30 minute discussion and then we'll use the remaining time for questions and discussion from our audience. We welcome those questions today uh, and during today's presentation. So please type them into the Q&A box in your Zoom control panel. Thank you to those who have already submitted questions when registering. Now we will endeavor to get to as many of these questions as possible uh, with our time constraints that we are facing. Now, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce the 2020 UTS Alumni Business Award recipient, Mr. George Savides, uh, Order of Australia. George is one of the Australia, uh, Australian most highly regarded business leaders from across many sectors, including health, technology, broadcasting, and the not-for-profit and humanitarian sectors. In 2016, George retired as CEO of Medibank Private, Australia's largest health fund, where under his leadership for 14 years, market capitalization improved from 1 billion to 6 billion and Medibank successfully completed their IPO onto the, AS, uh, the Australian exchange in 2014. Prior to Medibank, he was CEO of Sigma Pharmaceuticals for five years, which he successfully listed via IPO to the Australian exchange in 1999 and acquired six businesses that significantly expanded the company's retail, wholesale, and manufacturing capability. George is currently many things, including chairman of Next Science Limited, chairman of SBS Australia, non-executive director of Ryman Healthcare in New Zealand, and non-executive director of IAG. In 2018, George retired as the chairman of World Vision Australia after 18 years of volunteer board level service. He was previously chairman of the Macquarie University Hospital and chairman of the King's Transport Group. In 2020, Australia Honor Day Honours, George was awarded the Order of Australia for, quote, significant service to the community, to charitable groups, and to business, end quote. We are absolutely delighted that he will be speaking today with us. So without further delay, please let's welcome George. Now, uh, I have a series of questions that we thought we would uh, begin and to kick off our discussion. So, George, we're, I hope you're ready for your uh, impromptu quiz. Yes, I am, Chris. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. And again, welcome. Great to have you. Uh, focusing on the healthcare sector, firstly, uh, and your years of leadership in this area, you've mentioned that healthcare is a constant challenge of access, quality, and affordability. Uh, can you share what are the main drivers and obstacles for an ideal, if not working, healthcare system? Well, well Chris, the, the three high-level principles of access, quality, and affordability are constantly changing within the health system. And for example, if it's access, it might be that our aging population challenges citizens to be able to access the system as they get older and frailer. Or it could be that new innovation produces uh, new clinical interventions that produce healthcare outcomes that are better than the past, but come at a significant cost. So affordability then plays into that dynamic system as well. And constantly is the task of ensuring quality 
is not only high, but consistent across the footprint of the broader health system. So it is a multivariate system that is constantly challenged and, and is always in play. You mentioned about the, um, the aging issue. Now, I know that this is a, of a, a very current and hot debate within Australia right now, as it is around the world. So with our current systems in various public and private organizations, are we prepared for an aging Australia population? Well, with aging, it's um, uh, the, the key challenges are making sure that we have enough prevention and forward plan in our health system. So if we're overweight in acute care, hospital-based care, and underweight in primary care, we're setting ourselves up for a degree of distress. And so the primary care system, our GPs, our pharmacies, our physios, dental, optical, all play an important role in keeping citizens healthy and also uh, producing a prevention approach to aging which means that we don't end up with uh, a calamity of uh, occurrences that are unplanned that hit the hospital and acute systems in a way that overload them. So a good indicator of a, a healthy uh, or a balanced health system for an aging population is to look for the strength of its primary care system. Very interesting. Um, just as a, as a follow up on that, how do you think the COVID crisis has affected that and, and put additional pressures on those systems? Yeah, look, there's, there's quite a, uh, a lot of medical professionals at the moment who uh, are concerned that in the uh, restrictions that are necessary to protect the population around the COVID infection, um, uh, we're also slowing down or restricting access to our primary care system for Australians who have chronic disease and other conditions. And if not doing it deliberately, maybe there's a fear of accessing primary care while COVID is pre prevalent in the community. And so that, that is a concern because while um, it's important to deal with the COVID infection crisis, we also need to make sure that the rest of the healthcare needs of our community and our population are being serviced uh, and not, uh, if you like, build up to create a, a reactionary uh, impact that uh, occurs once those restrictions are lifted. Oh, very interesting. How do institutions like UTS and other universities play a role in conceptualizing and innovating improvements in this healthcare sector? Well, as we referred earlier to this dynamic system of access quality and affordability, um, the dynamic process is fueled by innovation, whether it's end-to-end -end service delivery. Um, for example, we're seeing some of that innovation go live right now. The COVID crisis has unlocked the power of telehealth across Australia. And it's really exciting to see that, uh, that uh, we've got a, a new way of accessing a general practice consultation or other health specialist consultations as we try to avoid the human contact side of uh, uh, the risk management while this pandemic is alive. And so within the UTS environment, we will have very many dif disciplines. It could be data and analytics, it could be scientific research or clinical pathway research, or it could be around the funding models, uh, the way we deliver step-down care. In new, you know, we've seen a lot more healthcare in the home. That's a new way of doing healthcare delivery. Mm. And as these uh, various disciplines work across boundaries, collaborate to solve new problems, which is really when, you, when do you see that in a clearer way? You see that in a, in a university camp, campus like UTS where you see this rich array of diff different disciplines. But if you set them and set their minds to focus on a particular system, like a health system, you'll find that the people in data and analytics have just as much to contribute as those in health uh, professional courses or those in management courses or finance and accounting, because the broader health system requires all of that talent to come to the fore to improve the uh, future of healthcare. Okay. Now, you had mentioned about the, some of the changing nature of delivery in terms of uh, telehealth and other things. And I know that uh, some of the cutting edge work that is done by Ryman uh, is, is looking at new conceptualizations of the aged care space. Um, just as a, a follow on, uh, what do you think is the evolving nature of, as you said, where we'll do delivery for aged care? Uh, what will be the nature of that experience for the elderly 
that may be changing from what it was 20 or 30 years ago. Yeah. There's so much more power now to understand the current health condition of a human being. And uh, in rhyme and sense, older citizens, when we look at their constant data and analytics that are on the rhyme and health, say, health system that looks after around 11,000 citizens today, um, they're able to see uh, through the algorithms and the data work that they do in those vital sign collections, um, predictors for anticipating the next step in care. Um, looking for not only physical factors of care, but also social factors, mm -hmm. um, as well as dietary and physical exercise. And so uh, we'll have a healthcare system that's much more in tuned and able to interpret uh, needs in a dynamic sense, rather than in a reactive sense when some failure occurs and people have a look back. And then to go to the next level, there's even now some exploratory work around the data and analytics work that looks at behavior movement patterns that potentially can predict to a high degree of accuracy a potential for a fall or a mishap. Interesting. Because there's a sort of a buildup of a, a misstep or a stumble mm -hmm. uh, or, or, a, or a, a dizzy steadying period. And as those observation dynamics are captured in various new devices that are available, you know, the care attendants are much more able to anticipate and prevent uh, some of the things that produce uh, you know, some ter terrible outcomes when failure occurs. Uh, it's very fascinating, very fascinating and very uh, appropriate and apropos for what UTS is trying to do in, a, in its work on data analytics uh, and on AI. Um, let me just change the, the, the uh, focus a little bit and, and talk a little bit about your experiences as a CEO. And from your view and your vast experience, how has leadership changed in your experiences as a CEO on boards for not-for-profit versus for-profit companies? Well, the, the not-for-profit not sector and uh, community enterprise sector is certainly professionalizing. And uh, they, you know, they're already a very substantial part of our economy in terms of the employment numbers in not-for-profits and the size of the, uh, the greater economic uh, slice of cake that they present and services to the community. So over the trend there is that um, the level of professional work, um, practice, uh, the skill sets of those who are within those organisations are, are rising and becoming, if you like, um, no different to our, what you would call our conventional for-profit workforces. Um, certainly that's not everywhere, but some of the larger NFPs are showing that kind of commercial muscle and skill set and competency. But when it comes to leadership, your broader question, mm. the changes over time from you know, when I sort of started in that domain 30 years ago in my employment, you know, we moved from command and control, from hierarchical structures that were very much mirrors of military structures. Um, and also a degree of uh, maybe ego around leadership to a different kind of world today where high performing organizations come, uh, 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 are led by people who tend to be more um, team-based, collaborative, inclusive, maybe less on a pedestal, much more at the level of uh, the rest of the employees. Um, why? Because that's a better way to engage hearts and minds, focus people on a sense of purpose rather than a set of numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, and by achieving that higher goal of the purpose the organization has for itself and its customers or beneficiaries, the numbers flow. And, and so we've seen that kind of shift to, a, if you like, a much more connected and relational leadership style than the one I was uh, familiar with at the start of my journey. So, it, it, you know, it reminds me of something that we we're talking a lot about at universities, UTS in particular. In fact, it's one of our new stratagem for a 2027 uh, approach to the future is lifelong learning. Mm -hmm. So what immediately comes to mind is over your, over your career, and I won't say vast long career, I don't want to make you feel uh, ancient, Thank but it is see. extensive, extensive experience. Yes. Um, how, do, how did you keep professionally learning and growing throughout your career? Well, it's probably one of the things I should be very grateful for when I think of it, UTS, right? 
So I was in the first MBA class uh, in Sydney uh, in the early 80s. And um, my, the teachers, the, the lecturers who came and taught us in the main were men and women who had day jobs as well in the sense of being in corporate world. And they also had teaching responsibilities as faculty members uh, in the evening master's program. Mm. And so we had people from all kinds of commerce uh, and, and, and they come and teach. And what, and I was a part-time student doing a part-time MBA over four years. And I had my day job as well as an engineer and my classmates had the same. So there we were in a sort of in the working world in Korea with people who are uh, great teachers and faculty who also had assignments in the world of day career. And it was this rich conversation around the topics that we were uh, given, but we would be looking at those topics, not just if you like from an academic or theoretical perspective, but we would also test those conversations against our everyday experiences in our careers. And what that sort of taught me over time was to, to keep reading after my graduation, to keep looking at where were the leadership styles and models practiced out there in the world that produced high performing organizations? Uh, what was the role of the emerging computer revolution in the way that it lifted customer inter in intimacy and a better insight into customer needs. And so out of that sort of postgraduate experience at UTS, I never stopped picking up things to read and to inform myself about what was new and what else was coming through. Or, and even through to my time at Medibank, we would invite many uh, people who had you know, we'd written some great material or were part of a very significant uh, uh, innovation and we invite them to a leadership program every six months in the organization for our top 150 leaders and you know we even had an astronaut from NASA who would turn <laughs> up and tell their story and so I think this whole idea of you constantly introducing learning mm -hmm. and discovery while you're on the job while you're in career. Yeah so it is a very complimentary of lifelong learning, but through organizations, through universities, through the public sector. Well, with, it, with the kind of extensive and successful careers that you've had across a, a wide number of different sectors, is there a particular achievement or legacy that you're particularly fond or proud of that you'd be willing to share with the UTS alumni community? And may I say, now's not the time to be shy or modest. Right. Well, thank you, Chris. Um, look, it's probably one that has just sort of shown its full form through this COVID experience. Hmm. Um, so around halfway through that 14 years as CEO of Medibank, we were doing the shift from an insurance company to a healthcare company. Because if you're insuring the healthcare needs of 4 million Australians, as we were at the time, we were finding ourselves needing to go deeper into healthcare so that our products and services and our insights were meeting customer needs more effectively than just the calculation of an actuary's assessment of claims requirements, i.e. just the insurance model. So we had to shift to healthcare as an organization. So we purchased a couple of businesses and one of the most radical acquisitions we made, it was sort of outside the four dots of a health insurer, probably around the year 2010. Uh, 2009 was the acquisition of um, McKesson's high performance healthcare organization, their telehealth business in Asia Pacific. So it was based in Australia. Uh, some Australian founders uh, put it together, and the large American company McKesson's acquired it and expanded it through to New Zealand and parts of Asia. So I just felt that we at Medibank needed that telehealth capability to complement the work of the health fund, to be able to be available 24 seven with health professionals, able to answer the healthcare needs of its customer base and thinking about primary care being a, a very important part of healthcare for an aging population. We needed access to be easy, to be high quality and professional and consistent. So we spent the hundred and whatever million it was to acquire the board, uh, accepted the proposition that management had put to it. 
So in the last few months, um, it's absolutely, you know, expanded into a very significant part of the Australian landscape. It does, on behalf of state governments and federal government, a whole lot of telehealth work today in a contract relationship with those governments. It also services its, its own Medibank uh, membership. It runs 1-800-RESPECT as well and does a bit of work as a front-end telehealth for um, Beyond Blue and other organisations. So it's continued to grow, but its relevance now has been absolutely confirmed as telehealth has become an accepted part of the healthcare ecosystem. So I just look back on that and say, look, I, I thought it might help a percentage of the 4 million Australians in Medibank when we acquired it. To see it now expand to service an entire Australian population in the various relationships it has with state and federal governments is pretty exciting. I'm glad it was a good investment. And, uh, you know, not, not every M&A deal is a, is a successful one, but that one seems like it's one that's lasted and has more value to contribute. Uh, well, before I turn it over to the audience for their questions, just one final question, <clears throat> excuse me, one final question for me. Uh, upon reflection, are, are there particular skills or advice that you would recommend to the younger George Savides as he walked into his first MBA class in the 1980s? Yeah, yeah, certainly. I'd say to that young George Savides, don't get so stressed about the exams and the assignments. <laughs> Uh, and because uh, there was a bit of that. And also, look, enjoy the ride of that education experience. Enjoy not only what you learn from the front of the lecture theatre, if you like, but also from those who are participating with you. Okay. Well, I'm going to turn it over uh, to the, uh, the audience. We already have a number of questions, but I just want to remind everyone that if you type it into the um, dialog box at the, at the bottom of your screen, you can ask, uh, ask additional questions. Our first question is, with so many players in the healthcare sector it, within Australia and their need for commercial return or cost justification, is Australia at risk of heading down the high cost system like the United States? Well, that's a great question. And look, there are a lot of providers and players in the system. Australia, by the way, is one of the world's great contributors to innovation in healthcare. Um, we'll see some of that come to play as we go through the vaccine program but, uh, for the virus. But, um, you know, we're major players in innovation in cancer care, in cardiac care in the world. Um, as we know, CSL, our blood products and vaccines company, is a world leader. So, you know, we, we just don't, we're not just a busy sector for the sake of the Australian market. We serve a world market in many areas. Um, but are we at risk? Look, um, the, one of the distinct attributes of the Australian system is that it does have a deeply embedded universal health care system framework. Every Australian has access to a free public hospital. Every Australian has access to a bulk bill, general practitioner consultation. Um, the PBS, quite a unique capability in the Australian system, the pharmaceutical benefits scheme. You know, we think a, a blister pack of medication from a pharmacist is around $28, $30 for that set. But in most cases, you're holding three, four, five hundred dollars worth of medication, mm -hmm. dramatically subsidized uh, through the uh, common economic system of the public health system. So I think with those frameworks that sort of are our foundational frameworks and beliefs about health care for all in terms of access, affordability and quality, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we're going to stumble into that US uh, uh, whirlpool of very high cost care and an uneven access uh, that uh, does uh, play out in certain parts of the country. Okay. Uh, next question is, you led Medibank from a government owned asset through to a public, uh, publicly listed company. Given the current philosophy, challenges that is, of government ownership of assets and uh, fighting for enough funding, is SBS a community asset possibly earmarked for change to a pure commercial TV channel and broadcaster? Well, as a public broadcaster, we believe at SBS we have a unique role to play as along with our other ABC public broadcaster. Um, in a world of um, global ownership of media streams and entertainment streams, which are continuing to sort of aggregate into global platforms, um, who have shareholders to benefit and to appease, 
um, as well as owners. Uh, the role of public broadcaster is becoming even more relevant and even more distinctive. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, we're deeply committed at SBS to, uh, to the virtues and value of public broadcasting. Uh, we don't believe that there's a reason to see that change, but also in its fantastic ability to reach uh, Australians across uh, over 60 languages across our radio platforms and our multicultural, multi-language uh, uh, platform delivery on, on demand and free-to-air television. So that particular attribute uh, is uh, unique and to keep it unique, uh, that, pub that government ownership paradigm of uh, public broadcasting is necessary uh, so that uh, we stand out from the rest. Okay. Next question we have is um, someone's asking, is there a particular high performance leader or organization that you would recommend for that for a current MBA student and a mid-level manager to look at as a as a model. I look in particular uh, names of organisations. I, I, I look maybe it's best to just sort of name the ones that I know rather than see as a label. So look, uh, let me say something about Ryman Healthcare, the aged care mm -hmm. organisation. I've been on that board now for around seven years. Um, you know, it is a today uh, probably a six billion dollar valuation i think it's the sixth largest company on the nzx uh, public new zealand company uh, has 36 villages eleven thousand residents about six six thousand staff um, its distinct uh, characteristic is kindness uh, anywhere you walk in any of those villages you'll see the staff nurses and carers who have a cheerfulness, a concern and a consideration for the elderly that they care for in those villages from independent living to service apartments through to high care and dementia care. And that culture drives uh, a wonderful experience for the resident. It's great for the staff to be amongst that peer group, but it also drives most outstanding financial and commercial results as well. It is a high performing organization. It's been evaluated by global peer groups to be one of the leaders in the world in the work that it does. And it has a powerful economic model, given that it is also a company that constructs all of its villages itself. It is a major construction company. Mm -hmm. And that has an economic advantage for the cost of care uh, by being internal internalized. So um, they're, they're moving to the next generation of the data and analytics and the AI work around care. So they're, they're care providers in an innovative way going forward. And uh, I couldn't recommend a better organization to go on a journey with than uh, Ryman. Very interesting, very interesting. Sounds, again, as you were saying earlier, very innovative organization as well. Well, we've got a question here. Um, I'm, I'm gonna jump around a little bit so we can keep the theme and then we'll be moving on to a different theme in a moment. But from Vito Coro uh, Corozo, what is George's view as to why leadership teams in corporate Australia uh, don't reflect the cultural and linguistic diversity of the broader population of Australia. Mm. Well, that, that's right. There's been much uh, spoken about this. And, um, you know, when you walk into an SBS, you see the world, right? It's a, it's a multicultural, multi-talented organisation and uh, very different to the sort of normal constructs that you'd expect in a corporation. Um, my hope is that it's an improving uh, dynamic that's been described here. Um, certainly our universities are producing a wide array of talented and gifted people from very many parts of the world. And, you know, our hope is that that is manifested across our commercial landscape. Australia is a great multicultural nation. Uh, nearly half of Australians population either has been born overseas or has at least one parent born overseas. So we are out there to be um, quite diverse and I think wonderfully inclusive. Um, we're never perfect. We're always, in, you know, it's like the healthcare system we talked about earlier, uh, Chris. It's um, it's something you've got to constantly work on. And, uh, you know, I have empathy for the question that has been raised. Yeah, very interesting. Would you, just as a follow on to that, certainly we've been seeing in the press uh, a lot of division and uh, strife within the United States for a variety of reasons. How is it that Australia although it does have those challenges, doesn't seem to have erupted in the way that certainly other countries like the US have. What do you, what do you attribute to that 
um, embrace of diversity and inclusion? Yeah, look, I, the Scanlon Foundation does some wonderful work in this area to understand our, the, the attributes and, and contributors to inclusion. And they actually run an index that evaluates that on a yearly basis. And we at SBS are very closely uh, connected with that organisation for us to understand it as well. But look, I think apart from um, the significant migration program that started after the, the war in its largest sense, the Second World War, and it's continued all through the consequential decades. Um, you know, we have been a thriving economy because we've had a high population growth materially underpinned by migration. Um, that migration has in the main been met with economic engagement, that people were able to find work and therefore able to sustain an economic future as well as a social engagement and, mm -hmm. and connectivity. Um, you sort of need all of those attributes. You need to feel like people understand your difference, that your language can find a way to be expressed. We obviously work hard at that at SBS. Mm -hmm. uh, that you feel uh, appreciated, uh, even, even through the difference that you bring to the community from another place. You know, we do certainly do it with food. Uh, we might do it with clothing and dress and music mm -hmm. and other forms, uh, multi-faith um, expression as well. So I think Australians have been able to welcome um, migrants who've created livelihoods here in Australia. And that's been successful and connected because there's been that broader economic and also employment connection that brings a sense of self-worth to an individual, helps the next generation settle with education and, and, and a, a future for them. So I, I think that's been key. And, and I suspect in other parts of the world, in other examples, when that doesn't happen, uh, people feel isolated, uh, there, there's a deficiency in their experience mm -hmm. uh, and that has a deleterious effect in terms of uh, social byproducts. Yeah. Well, just as a, a quick follow on uh, to your discussion about Ryman, uh, Lily Batista Favero asks, how is it that Ryman Healthcare's culture, how is it that it was created? And is there a leadership model behind that? That's a great question. I'm glad somebody asked that because um, it's a simple answer. Uh, it was started by a, a policeman in Christchurch, the organization, who bought an old motel and converted that motel into a very small intimate aged care center. Huh. Uh, he, he was motivated because uh, the experience of his parents and the need that they had to provide could be provided with care in their older years. Um, the motto from the very beginning, and it is there today if you look at the annual report, is that. Uh, for Ryman, the care has to be good enough for mum or dad. So it's quite personal. If every employee brings that purpose statement into their own mindset, good enough for my mother or my father, then how do I go to work? How do I show up? But when the call bell occurs and there's a need to respond and I'm busy and not everything came together perfectly that day, so I'm a bit grumpy. Hmm. Um, that sense of why I'm here, and, and if it was my own parent that was asking for my support in this particular circumstance in a work situation. And so it's, it's fostered you know, this wonderful culture uh, that uh, absolutely puts as number one uh, their care. And out of that comes a great uh, a followership. So, you know, the organization builds villages and before they're completed, uh, there's a queue of people signing up to find their way into their apartment or to their place. And uh, they've also been able to track the experience as well. So you, when you start at a Rhyme village or you're with your golf clubs and your independent lifestyle in a lovely apartment. And as things get more challenging in life, uh, the, the continuum of care exists across the campus. And so there's no need to sort of be disrupted from the people you know and the facilities that are around you. Uh, you can grow into the entire need journey and not be disrupted. And Ryman has been quite unique at that and that's why they've been successful. Oh, but it goes back to thinking about, well, if it was my parent I was looking after here, what are their needs as they get older uh, through the experience of those villages? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, we've got a question uh, from Nitya uh, Karmakar. Uh, uh, Nitya says, I recently read that private healthcare membership is declining. 
Is this a worrying concern for people and the system as a whole? I think the, the true stat is that the membership numbers themselves uh, remain pretty stable. It's the percentage of the population that's declining and given that the population is growing, yeah, that, mm -hmm. the percentage is dropping off a little. Yes, I think the, the cost side of uh, private health insurance continues to grow. Um, back in the good old days when I was there, there was a thing called a 30% rebate, a federal government subsidy for the premiums that you pay to be in health insurance. Um, a few years back, that rebate w went from a solid percentage number um, to a fixed dollar value. And as the premiums grew, the percentage started to dilute. So today, I think the private health insurance rebate might be around 20%. It's continued to slide. And therefore, that subsidy has diluted. And that's been part of the reason the premiums have grown faster than inflation. And so that's obviously uh, hurt the uh, hip pocket. Will it plateau out or re rebalance? I think it must over time. Um, government may choose to re-enter with a stronger subsidy. I'm not sure where, what that thinking is at the moment. But if you think about what happens if people don't take up the elective surgery cover in private health insurance, mm -hmm. um, they end up falling on the public system and that outcome produces a higher cost overall to this dynamic healthcare system that we talked about at the beginning. And if that's the case, then uh, they will have to bring back some new incentives to keep people incentivated to hold their private cover so that the public and private systems look after each other as a companion play. Um, that's been the, the, the balance that has occurred in the past. If that starts to fall out of balance because of costs, I think there will be some interventions to rebalance it. Okay. Well, again, changing uh, focus a little bit, we have a question. It's actually for both of us, both Chris and George. Um, the question is, with so much continued education, content available these days, how do you eliminate the noise from you know, the less relevant to the most relevant and perhaps away from the loudest to, but maybe not as relevant? Mm. Well, I think from my, my area, I'm always looking for things that have been demonstrated to work. So I don't mind reading about propositions and theories. It might jog my thinking to look at different places to apply my practice. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm often more interested in research findings, uh, especially where I am in my kind of life at the moment. I, if I'm on a board and I'm looking at uh, some issues around governance or organisational performance, for example, work from home. This is a sort of a live topic, right? Uh, I want to know more about both the productivity, but also the, the emotional intelligence issues that play out or get suppressed that somehow produce in the mid and longer term uh, poorer uh, team-based performance, or if you like, some innovation that might have been missed, or some customer pain that got overlook, overlooked. So I'm, that's where I'm reading at the moment. With this shift, shift to uh, work from home, how are corporations adjusting? What are they learning? What do they want to keep? What do they want to restore back to what was? And what are the steps that will take us there? So that's sort of an example of how do I get rid of some of the noise? Be clearer about what it is that I'm looking to learn and to apply. And let me just add to that from the, from the university's perspective and the business school at UTS, I would agree completely. I think one of, the, one of the most challenging things for a learner, especially in lifelong learning, uh, is the, the, the plethora of material out there. It, you know, we can talk about, oh, well, we have some unique area that we are very, very good at in our research. And that's fine. That's really good. But if you go around the world, you'll find... There are lots of universities that are doing lots of work in that area. And so the question is, what differentiates that? If I want a, a class on artificial intelligence, yes, I can do it at UTS, but I can go and get one for free from Stanford or from Imperial uh, or from Cambridge. So what is it that differentiates? And I think for our perspective and what we're trying to achieve at the, at the university and at the business school, is a bit what you've just described, which is to provide up front a set of tailored baseline experiences for students to understand what really are their needs, what are their capabilities, um, 
what's their level of adaptability and flexibility? We have a professor named Robert Wood, who's a world expert on this area. And we're actually building in a smart system so that when you first come in, before you even ask the question, should I take a class on X? It assesses, well, who are you? What are your experiences? What is your background? Um, what proclivities do you have? And now let's talk about what kind of learning that you might want to engage in. And then it offers a variety of different potentially customized solutions that you can then look at and then decide. Um, well, I remember when I first started to look at some of the uh, online material that was available, I went to the, one of the real famous uh, uh, databases, which is Coursera. Well, Coursera is great, but it doesn't have any sorting mechanisms. And so I looked up, I was actually looking for something, believe it or not, on machine learning. I decided I wanted to learn a little bit about this, no pun intended. And I went and there were 50 or 60 different offerings. And I'm sure they were all very good, but I had no way of understanding, well, would this one be better suited for me? Would this one be, given my background, my experience, my knowledge? And so I think that's for us, you know, back to that question of how do, how do you sort out the loud and flashy from the substantive? I think it's mainly making sure that that substantive is tailored to you as an individual. So that we now are talking about mass customization of learning versus simply mass producing of learning. Um, there, there's another question here for you, which is, uh, George, what are the what do you think are the five say top five characteristics of an innovative leader? Hmm. Well, look, I think um, firstly, I'd 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 be saying to the those who are listening who are trying to help you know trying to work their way through being more uh, effective leader themselves, and you know we use the word leadership here not just to be the person at the top of a pyramid, but you'll lead a team, you're in a particular collaborative group, you have a particular responsibility. So firstly, I think effectiveness around uh, engagement comes through humility. If you have to have a sense of the we hmm. being stronger than the I. Okay, so that's an important starting point for a leader. Leaders who find it very difficult to break away from the needs of the I um, will find it hard to hear the voices of the team. And you, the second piece is to understand that your most powerful delivery of leadership in terms of impact and outcomes doesn't come from you. It comes through you, through the team, mm. and it's their work, however big that team is, however many layers there are in the organisation. It comes through that pathway, that impact occurs. So remember, as a leader, you're not there to have all of the answers. Thirdly, what is the picture of leadership in your, hand, in your head? What is your metaphor or your narrative for leadership? I've got a couple that have helped me. Um, and it comes in, you know, some of the authors have majored on this area, books like Good to Great, other, other authors as well. Um, one is um, that I'm less of a captain and more of a coach, um, that I don't have to uh, score all the goals, uh, that my job is to make sure that the team understand amongst themselves their particular areas of strength, how they actually work together to deliver that, that complementary strength into a solution or a movement or a change or a, sol a solving, an innovation. Um, Another metaphor besides, say, coach rather than captain is a, a, one that I think is a really strong one is think of yourself as when you think leadership as a conductor of an orchestra. That you didn't get the job because you're the best player of a particular instrument. At, at Medibank, I wasn't a great actuary. I didn't, I was an engineer, right? So I didn't get the job because I was an engineer in a sense. Uh, the talent was in the team, the various instruments, the various players. My job was to conduct that talent around a particular strategy or score and give everyone a sense of a role that they each had, a validation of each of that, those talents. And then, and then the job of the leader is to facilitate their contributions in a way that is harmonious, is productive and creative. 
So think about the metaphor when you think about what your job is in your particular assignment of leadership. Um, the other one is, I think we're up to four, beware of the red socks. Now, this is a metaphor that I've sort of produced over the years. Um, so sometimes as a leader, you want to get some things done and you have some critical path timelines. You might have a board that's breathing down your neck, expecting you to deliver on time, on budget and full spec. And, you know, things always don't go to plan and you've got some bumps in the road. And you've got a particularly brilliant person running a particular project that's got it in good shape and it's looking like it's on time. But the problem is that that person doesn't live the values of the organisation. So they're a bit, they're a bit brutal. Uh, there are tears in the team. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some fear there as well. So the red sock is the metaphor around when George accidentally put a red sock in the whitewashing and in the washing machine and everything else turned out pink when he brought it out. So but when you as a leader condone through not acting behavior that delivers an outcome in terms of a timeline, but damages the culture is inconsistent with the values we stand for that support the purpose and mission. When you condone that as a leader, you damage deeply. It's not just the individual that is the problem. You're condoning of that behavior that's inconsistent with the signed up values and behaviors. That condoning impacts the direct people that that individual impacts, but in turn, it sends a message more broadly to the whole organization that the boss really isn't signing up to the values that we, st we stand for. So, so when there is a red sock, you have to call it out. If it's not able to be remediated and, and reformed, you can't just let it fester. It will damage the team. It will damage the end performance, irrespective of whether that project came in on time or not. Sure. So I guess I'm, I'm sharing from my learning here. And, and so I've made a few mistakes in time. And one of them is, George, in a professional and caring way, you've got to deal with the red socks. So I think I've got up to four. Chris, I, I might stop there. <laughs> okay. Well, listen, we, we have another, um, uh, the penultimate question we have from Angela Todd, who says, who asks, Australia has a great healthcare system, but not a perfect system. Inequities of access and quality exist by geography, socioeconomic status, et cetera. What would be your top priorities for investment or redesign to improve these inequities? Yeah, I like that question. So if you, if you were to map, and it's a great task for a, a, an undergraduate program, but if you were to map the various pathways of the, say, the top 30 or 40 um, disease um, treatment pathways that we have in this country, whether it's hypertension or cardiology, or whatever, you know, we can map the frequencies of the most common. And you look at what, where people go. You know, they get a test done here, another test over here, a different kind of test. Those, those particular results have to land back at the GP. You've got to go back to the GP. That needs a particular piece of medication. That drug doesn't get on well with the second drug that you need. So then you've got to space the time. Um, and then there's another specialist because you've got complications in the treatment. You then have to find acute care. You have to have some surgery. And then there's post-op. The pathway to our major treatments are often disjointed. Mm -hmm. There's not a common information piece that is centered around the patient. It's often centered around individual providers and they're not connected. And so the biggest burden that we carry in our current system, as good as it is, is that it's not efficient. Hmm. That we waste effort, resources and time. And a lot of that time falls back into the experience of the, of the patient. Mm -hmm. The loss of time, the, less, the loss of continuity, the, the sense that their particular file or history is not known to everyone on that pathway and therefore mistakes are made because of that. So in short, I think we need to relook at our very good system and make it more continuous, make it flow better. And we may need to move the lens from individual providers who are working hard to be efficient to the lens of the patient journey to make it much more optimal because we also send many, many patients into the wrong pathways, a lot of dead ends, mm. a lot of tests that are never read, 
uh, a lot of uh, um, pathways that have already been proven some years ago to be unproductive, but are still in the system because we haven't updated it. Um, we have talked about a, a universal health record to assist this. It's still not live. It's still not available in a user-friendly sense. So that's probably a, a pretty practical starting point. Excellent, excellent. Well, this brings us to our last question. Last question is on the work from home theme. Mm. What skills and experiences will future leaders need to focus on and develop to effectively lead a remote workforce of the future? Yes, well, look, I, Chris, the jury's still out on that one because we're still <laughs> trying to answer that, but it's a great question. I, I suspect that we have to find a way to not have that entire work experience be through a cable and a screen. That there has to be, whether it's town hall catch-ups or, or sub-buddy groups that are more relational and that the topic isn't just work. Mm -hmm. The topic is about what I did with my kids or, you know, my dog or you know, this kind of broader conversation about life uh, because it's, we bring our whole lives to work and the best work environments, the most creative, the higher performing, where people support each other rather than blame each other, they're organisations that are deeply relational and respectful. And the two dimensional, you know, uh, cable experience of uh, teleconference is not going to be strong enough uh, to unlock that human dimension. So we have to find ways where we do experience the, the human relational piece in a meaningful way. Uh, so it's that, that sheer humanity that will make the difference in the end. Mm. Well, listen, George, this is, it's been a fascinating opportunity to not only learn more about you and about your career, but also about your thoughts for the future of healthcare and leadership more broadly. So thank you so much. I am particularly taking away from this a couple of things. Uh, one is the, the whole notion of telehealth and the significance of remote delivery in a person's own home along the lines of what you've described with Ryman and others. Um, it's a very different model of healthcare for the future. I also really enjoyed your perspectives on, on leadership uh, but in particular, I'll, I don't think I'll forget for a long time to come the red sock. Uh, and I think that's an excellent insight. Um, but, but also this idea of the humanity, that, that leadership, and I think it exemplifies the wonderful contributions you've made over the years. And quite frankly, a lot of the basis for your honor of being uh, from the Order of Australia is that you've given of yourself an ethical, moral, and societal commitment of oneself when you were already a very demonstrated, a very successful business leader in the private sector and the public sector, but you went beyond that and gave into your community, into a higher level of service. And I think that's a, probably the most important theme that I take away from today's discussion. And it makes us very proud to once again reiterate that you are our 2020 alumnus of the Business School, alumnus of the year, and for very, very many reasons. So I wanna just thank you again for your fantastic uh, insights. And I'd like to thank our audience. Uh, I hope the audience enjoyed this discussion as much as I did. Uh, so thank you, George, so much. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and as I mentioned uh, a little bit earlier, today's discussion is part of the UTS Illuminated webinar series. And each session is available on the UTS alumni website. Everyone, thank you for joining us today. And I hope you have a wonderful afternoon.